Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's afternoon, right? It's one or not? It's still 12. 12.59, so it's good morning. Okay. Um, well, we have an amazing speaker today. I have no clue what he's talking about. It's my first time here and I'm enjoying it. And I'm just gonna be here to talk and make sure he can shine. Um, today we're gonna speak to Jeremy Zimmerman. Um, who knows him? Okay, come on guys. I'm introducing Jeremy Zimmerman. <laughs> And I think he's talking about copyrights, enforcements versus freedom. And I really, really want to know what you guys feel about it. But first of all, I'm going to let the man talk and um, say welcome to Jeremy Zimmerman for one more time. Hello, everyone. Thank you to be here. Um, it's a honor uh, to have such a, a great audience to, to bore uh, <laughs> today. Um, it's no wonder for anyone here that a um, very high number of threats is actually right now, today, attacking our fundamental freedoms and the very structure of the internet. It's very hard to talk after Rob, because he mostly talked about everything. But you see, you see what I'm referring to. There is an extremely strong addition of converging forces attacking our fundamental freedoms today. I'm talking, of course, of censorship, the blocking of website that inevitably leads to political censorship and other forms of censorship of the internet. There will be a great talk afterwards about it. You, you all know about it already. I'm talking of all form of harm that is done to net neutrality for commercial purposes that equally harms our fundamental freedoms of freedom of expression or privacy online. But today I will focus on copyright enforcement, which is one of the, the major drives for attacking our freedoms online. So f for those of you who don't, don't know about it, I'm the, the founder and spokesperson of La Quadrature du Net. Uh, La Quadrature du Net is a citizen organization. Uh, we're a kind of citizen toolbox. So we provide tools, analytical tools, web-based tools for everyone to understand what is going on and to participate in the legislative process when our fundamental freedoms are harmed. Um, I need to stress at this point that we support Wikileaks very much in their mission of bringing truth. We, we participate in helping them. And also I want to stress out at this stage that uh, many people are tempted to take the easy way of the, the attacks and the criticisms and so on. When at this stage, what we all should be focused on is the reaction to Wikileaks the reaction to the cable gate, the violence of the attacks against Wikileaks. It is exactly what we are talking about. It is about governments trying to control the internet, governments trying to censor the internet and bypass any form of judicial authority. So, unfortunately, I won't talk about this now. I will focus on the, the copyright enforcement issues. and. Um, if you allow me, maybe, we will try a little experiment today. So, we will put ourselves in the shoes of our enemies. So, I will ask you all to close your eyes for a minute. Close your eyes. Okay, so, now you are in the shoes of an executive from the music or the movie industry. So, <laughs> somebody, somebody died already. So, I see it's working. Uh, as you're becoming one of them, you get a bit stupider. You're a bit clueless. But you're extremely powerful. You got lots of resources and lots of connections. Okay, so now open your eyes. What do you see? Pirates. 
Everybody. Pirates. Nobody is learning, nobody is teaching, nobody is remixing, nobody is improving. No, everybody is pirating. It's understandable. Your business model was always based on creating copies, distributing copies, controlling the distribution of the copies. And now everybody else invented that great machine that is a copy machine, that is called the internet. Therefore, everybody is an obstacle to your business. Everybody is a pirate. Okay, so what do you do? Everybody is a pirate, then you have a problem. Then you sue them. You go through the legal justice system, but it doesn't really work. You know, it's, it's cumbersome, it, has, it takes some time, it costs you lots of money, uh, you have to deal with those stupid things such as presumption of innocence, you have to provide valid evidence, people have the right to a fair trial, <laughs> whatever that means. So, nah, it doesn't work. You do it for some years, then people are not afraid, people still continue to be pirates, huh? Hmm. So we need to go to the next steps. So, if we cannot use the law to properly discourage people, then we need to change the law. And for that, what do we need? Well, you <laughs> need the right people to be elected for that. Actually, this guy said, you need the celebrities to be elected. And it's not a metaphor. So, you either help them to be elected, or if it's legal in your country, you directly fund their campaigns. And once they're here, you know, you can go and meet them, you invite them here and there, blah, 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 and you get some laws to be passed. So, let's think for a minute. You're back in 2005, 6, 7. The trials didn't work, so you think, okay, maybe we can have the perfect law against those goddamn pirates. So, we will set up an administrative authority, then we will have our private police that will send them IP addresses, then they will send emails, and then maybe they can disconnect the people from the internet. <laughs> You've all heard about this, that's the nefarious Adopi law in France, which is an epic failure at the moment. Uh, yeah, we're very proud of that. So, we campaigned for, for years, we ultimately got a decision, historical decision from the Constitutional Court in France that said that freedom of speech implies freedom to access to the Internet. Therefore, you cannot have some random administrative authority messing up with your Internet connection and restricting your Internet connection. So the whole point of the Adopi law was to circumvent the judicial authority and the Constitutional Council said, well, you cannot do it without a judicial authority. So the government put back a judge into the whole Adopi scheme and it's failed. Um, our bet here is that there will never be a cutoff from the Adopi. But, okay, that's another epic fail. And then you think, okay, so, hmm, it's socially quite unacceptable to cut off people from the internet. They're rebel. Okay, so maybe we'll go to some finer type of uh, restrictions. Maybe we'll go for different sanctions, but mm, we don't exactly know why. So, we make another experiment, and that's in the UK, the Digital Economy Bill that was voted and therefore became the Digital Economy Act. We cannot any longer call it the debil, which is a pity, but... Hmm. Um, so, you try it and you give to the government full power to decide whatever sanction there could be. And as an improvement over the French model, you manage to get rid of an administrative authority. So the, the rights holders will deal directly with the internet service providers, directly with the internet access providers to establish sanctions. So this is something very important. I think we got an idea here. Let's prolong that mechanism. Hmm. But we're here and it's 2000 nine or something, we got the Digital Economy Act passed, we had to rush things over, we literally had it adopted in a procedure called the wash-up procedure, uh, a memo from uh, our industry, the, the British phonographic industry, uh, said that it, if it's not adopted quickly, it may never been adopted at all. So, okay, we did things right, it's been adopted, 
No, I think that the UK government is, co is considering going backwards. Maybe some British people can comment about it afterwards. Okay, so we are still experimenting, you know, a bit here in France, a bit here in the UK, but it's not really moving forward. We need something bigger. We need something to, to make people more afraid, because of course, those schemes are based on fear. As for Adopi in France, some people today are a bit afraid of Adopi. They think, oh, maybe they can catch me after all. And so they stop doing file sharing, they stop going on networks and public places and so on. So those schemes basically only work if you're afraid of them. So it's, it's not enough yet. So we're still in the shoes of those industries and we think we got to move to the next step. We need something bigger, we need something global, and we need something where those bloody citizens won't get into our feet and won't try to, to ruin the things. So, who among you have heard about ACTA already? Oh wow, <laughs> oh wow, that's almost everybody, that's wow. That's, I knew it was one of the smartest crowds around. Well, um, ACTA is a fraud to start with. It is disguised as a trade agreement. ACTA stands for Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement. You know those trade agreements where several countries gather and say, okay, I buy your bananas for that price, but at the same time I buy your oil for that price, and you know, if you don't sell your bananas, then you're, no, no, no. Okay, so like a regular trade agreement about the trading of goods, but that goes a bit further, you know? Um, it deals with counterfeiting of um, medicines, you know, those fake medicines that kill people, it's a real problem, oh my, yeah. Um, fake medicines, fake auto parts, you know, those fake Chinese auto parts that kill people, oh my, yeah, yeah. And piracy, whatever that means. You know, those people mm, who kill artists, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so all this is put in the same bag. And we say it's a trade agreement. Therefore, we don't need any oversight from the parliament. We don't need any transparency. We just gather amongst like-minded countries, to quote the word of a representative from the US negotiators. And that's 39 countries, including the 27 member states of the EU, represented by the European Commission, so one of the non-democratic institutions of the EU, that are, for years, around the table, Negotiating is like an open bar. You can put everything you want into it. So for years, it has been secret. So those bloody activists couldn't know what was going on. Then there were some rumors, then some leaks, you know, those evil, pinky, communisto, anarcho, anarchists of WikiLeaks. Uh, the first versions of ACTA were leaked on WikiLeaks at first. Then La Quadrature du Net took care of leaking some others. So for, for years, those activists had to rely on leaks to know what was going on. But then, the pressure put by the European parliaments, once again under, under influence by the, by the activists, allowed for some text to be published. So, okay, I'll get out of the shoes of the of the entertainment industries at this, at this time because it hurts my feet. Um, okay, more seriously, now we know what is in ACTA. It has been a long struggle by itself to be able to know. But now the big fight is here because we have the actual content of it. So I'm, I come to the boring part of ACTA. It's coming. Um, what you have to understand is that there are already international organizations in which you're supposed to deal with those matters of copyright and patents and so on. It's called WIPO, it's also the WTO since the TRIPS agreement, but those industries do not even want to deal with them anymore because they're stuck. For some years now, the poor countries come to WIPO and say, where the fuck are you going? going stronger and stronger, further and further with copyright. Maybe there should be another way. So the, the, the real institution that exists to debate, I wouldn't say democratically, but to debate at least publicly of those issues, an international platform dedicated to that, is also being bypassed. 
it gives you really an idea of how far those people want to go. And so, as of the 3rd of December, the final version of the text has been published. It is final. There's no way that we can change a word in what is ACTA at this stage. And now for the boring part. So, the boring part. What is really in ACTA? You will read. This is the Article 23 uh -huh. about the criminal offences. Each party shall provide for criminal procedures and penalties to be applied at least in cases of willful trademark counterfeiting or copyright or related rights piracy, whatever that means, on a commercial scale. And also those criminal procedures and penalties, the, 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 the signatories of ACTA shall ensure that criminal liability for aiding and abetting is available under its law. Now look at this. Criminal procedure and penalties for piracy, whatever that means, on a commercial scale. And then you ask yourself, what is a commercial scale? That's a very good question. This bit was purposefully left vague as you see it. So it is completely open to interpretation at this stage. Anyone can come and say, oh look, one million people sharing one file. It's a commercial scale. Indeed. So you get rid of the commercial intent that would be the only way to limit what is acceptable and what is not. If you want to make business out of making copies, then okay, I'm okay. It's infringement. So instead of the intent, we consider here the commercial scale. So the industries can hire lawyers, make them work on making anything fit into that notion of commercial scale. Also, you notice criminal liability for aiding and abetting? Aiding and abetting? Seriously? This, again, is so vague. Am I doing this noise? Hmm? Oh, how? Hmm. Uh, this notion of aiding and abetting is so vague that you can make anything fit into it. Think internet service provider. Think internet access provider. Think any kind of online platform any kind of technology. Of course, you make a BitTorrent client. Indeed, you're inciting, you're, you're aiding and abetting, of course, for infringement. So basically, this tool is a kind of atom bomb pointed to anyone we would want to make comply. And comply with what? Well, that's the rest of the agreement for more boring part. The Article 27 is called Enforcement in a Digital Environment. Here you read, blah, blah, blah. Each party shall ensure the enforcement procedure are available under its law so as to permit effective action against an act of infringement of intellectual property rights which take place in the digital environment, including expeditious remedies to prevent infringement and remedies which constitute a deterrent to further infringements. And then, ask yourself once again with your hacker's mind, what is preventing infringement in the digital environment? If not filtering, blocking of access, restriction of access, what else could it be? Now ask yourself, what is a deterrent to further infringement? I won't go up to science fiction movie plots where cops act on the future, you know? But deterrent to further infringement? Here again, as far as you can think, you will only see filtering, blocking, and restrictions of access. If you continue the reading, you'll see, well, it looks quite harmless. Each party shall endeavor to promote cooperative efforts within the business community to effectively address blah, 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 infringement. Well, those cooperative efforts, we're quite familiar with at this stage. We're familiar with them because it's approximately the wording that is in the Digital Economy Act in the UK. It is approximately the words used by the European Commission in its own communications about IPR infringement. And when they talk about cooperative efforts, it means that the rights holders and the internet service and access providers will work together. It means literally that internet service providers will have to obey to the rights holders to find common agreements. Yes, then what it means is that there is no judicial authority anymore here. This is exactly how you bypass judicial authority. 
So, on top of the private copyright police, of the entertainment industries surveilling the networks, collecting IP addresses, with this mechanism, you add a private copyright justice on the internet. You make sure that the internet service providers, that any actor online, will have enough legal pressure with the commercial scale, criminal sanction, and so on. So when the rights holders will come and say, oh, now you will cooperate, or else, well, you get sure that now they will comply. So it is literally a framework to ensure that the signatories of ACTA will be able to deploy schemes such as the Digital Economy Act, such as the ADOPI, and such as more evolved schemes that will indeed include filtering of the net. You all know that first they come with the child porn and impose the filtering of the net, and then they can use it for other purposes. The recording and movie industry have been requesting filtering of the net for years. In France, President Sarkozy, in his New Year's wishes to the world of culture, literally said, if Adopi is not enough, we will need to go further, and for this, we will experiment with no delay filtering schemes. He said it already. He literally already promised it to the very same entertainment industries that got the Adopi. So, with ACTA, you got a framework ready to deploy on a massive scale those schemes. And now you think, okay, no, this is one extra bit, it's a special, special thread for German people keen on privacy. A party may provide, in accordance with its laws and regulations, its competent authorities with the authority to order an online service provider to disclose expeditiously to a right holder information sufficient to identify a subscriber whose account was allegedly used for infringement. How do you like it? So, signatories of ACTA will make sure that the rights holders can directly get personal data about alleged infringers Alleged, which means not going through a judge, not going through the judicial authority, seriously? My personal data? Okay, so, the most twisted minds among you, or the lawyers, uh, will have noticed that this begins with a May. And so when we go into the, into the European Parliament or in, uh, to the institutions to rant about that, they say, oh, but don't worry, there's a May. A may means it's not mandatory. A party may provide. They may or they may not. So it's a right. Don't worry. Well, actually we do worry. <laughs> we do worry because this sets a precedent. This is a strong political move if the countries sign for this, that they find it acceptable. And further, this is the, the icing on the cake. Further, in ACTA, you have an Article 42 mm -hmm. <laughs> that is part of a section called Institutional Agreements, where those guys are creating with ACTA an ACTA committee that will be able to review amendments. So once the ACTA will be signed, they can just gather again and say, oh, let's change this word. Oh, yeah, my dear friends, let's do that. So a May you read here could further become a shall, a must. And this is also something of great concern. Because if we accept the creation of ACTA with its ACTA committee able to make amendments, it means that we create a durable, parallel legislative process, well, non-legislative process, that will deal with the internet infrastructure with a direct impact on our freedom of speech, on our privacy, and on our fundamental right to a fair trial. And now you think, yes. So ACTA is an atom bomb to our fundamental freedoms and to the internet. So now you think, maybe, what shall we do? What can we do? Where can we put pressure? How can we make this to stop? Well, at this stage, there is only one answer the European Parliament. Whether you like it or not, 
It's the only democratic institution in the European Union. It's the only one on which we can have a weight. In ACTA, the EU, we are all represented by the Commission. The Commission are unelected functionnaires, are the administrative body of the EU. So they are dealing with most of ACTA because they're in charge of the trade agreements. But as I told you, ACTA is much more than a trade agreement because it has criminal sanctions. And criminal sanctions are usually in the, the, the sovereignty of the member states. Well, now the European Parliament has its way to change the, the criminal law of the, 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 the member states. But so far, before the Lisbon Treaty, it has been in the hands of the member states. Therefore, along with the Commission, and I'm sorry if I bore you with that, but along with the Commission on the negotiation table of ACTA is also the presidency of the Council of EU that represents the government. So it's literally the governments dealing with new criminal sanctions outside of any democratic process with the European Commission. So we have to attack their legitimacy to deal with our fundamental freedoms without a proper democratic debate. And the only place to do that is the European Parliament. We had several victories in the past in the European Parliament. You remember the, the software patents fight. You remember the telecoms package where we kicked out Adopi-like schemes in first reading and got all the members to get really concerned about oh, citizen rights and freedom and so on. We, we, we scored also about net neutrality, um, making sure that this notion will be not understood but at least taken care of. We made net neutrality to become a real issue in the, in the telecoms package. We managed to kick out some initiative reports and, and, and win on some, some minor votes along the time. So you must keep that in mind, that we can win in the European Parliament. And as for every campaign, as for every action, the probability of having a positive outcome is directly proportional to the energy we invest into it. This is why I'm here, and this is why I need you to take care about that. This is why we all need to take care about that. Because since the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament will now have one occasion to say its word on ACTA. It's a vote by yes or no. So you may think it's not enough for democracy, and I will agree, but that's where we are now. There will be a vote in that procedure called of consent, where the European Parliament will have to say yes or no to ACTA. And this is the next and final step on which we have an occasion, all of us, to wait in and make sure that our elected representatives will do their job of protecting our fundamental freedoms, they will work within their political groups, they will talk to their colleagues, and if we do that properly, if we raise enough energy, if we make enough noise all over the internet about this vote and these stakes, ultimately we have a chance to win. So I ask you here very solemnly to be aware of that, be careful about that and help us play a part and play a decisive part into defeating the motherfucker. Okay, I, I take this as a yes. <laughs> okay, so, more importantly, there are other issues that will be coming in the European Parliament in the next months, in the next years. You've all heard of IPRED, you've heard of IPRED 2. So IPRED 2 was set in the, in the freezer, then will come back, like in a bad horror movie. It's about new criminal sanctions for copyright once again. There is also the e-commerce directive that, will, that may be modified soon in the European Parliament. In the e-commerce directive, you get sure that internet service providers are not held liable for the actions of their users. But of course, that's what the entertainment industries want. So they will try to change it. 
And of course, you have the filtering issues, you'll hear more about it later. But what I want to stress at this stage is that as important as the battles we fight in the parliament, whether it's the European or the national parliaments, along with the legislative battles, we also have to fight a battle for the minds. It's an ideology that is on the other side. They're trying to change people's minds. The, the French Minister of Culture, Christine Albanel, when she, was, when she was alive, and when she was defending the Adopi law, literally said publicly in the French Parliament, Adopi, the three strikes, is about changing people's minds. It's about creating a psychological frame. So this is really what it is about. It is about an ideology. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, you all see what I'm referring to. All their policies are based on one very single lie. And looking again, sorry, more boring part, looking again at ACTA, you can find a smoking gun of their lies. They said, in determining the amount of damages for infringement of intellectual property rights, a party's judicial authority shall have the authority to consider inter alia any legitimate measure of value the right holder submits, which may include lost profits, the value of the infringed goods or services measured by the market price, or the suggested retail price. They have to write it somewhere. They have to make it law that the prejudice is measurable in lost profits, in market price, in suggested retail price. This is the core of their lie. When they say that file sharing harms them, they have never been capable of demonstrating that seriously. Therefore, they have to write it so you know it's right, because it's written. So, this is what pisses me off. Of course, you can produce figures that say, oh, look at the numbers, oh, we're all going to die. And they use that abundantly. There was a um, very important vote that we lost in the European Parliament about an initiative report that will prepare the future of copyright enforcement. It was the, the Gallo report. You probably didn't hear about it, or else you would have acted and we would have won. Um, in the Gallo report, the industry came up with a fantastic study. Methodology was complete rubbish. It said that piracy will cost Europe millions of billions of jobs. And the politicians got this and were oh, shaking. You look at the title and you start shaking. You don't need to go into the details, the, the methodology or whatever. And when the Social Science Research Council looked at the methodology, they laughed. The, the study said, okay, money will just poof, vanish. That's life, no? Huh? And then artists will die and jobs will be lost. So they have a very powerful way of producing fake evidence of their ideology. But if you look at the real data, you see that the budget of people for culture is increasing all the time, a long time. Well, of course, video games are culture. We all know that. Don't we? But some people didn't understand that yet. So this is among the things we need to make them understand. If you look at the concerts, and this is a study, very recent study from October 2010, you see that literally since Napster, the concerts exploded. This is for the US, but the figures are the same all over, all over Europe. If you look at the ticket sales in the cinema, you will see once again record years in the last years. And at this URL on the bottom, lqdn.fr slash p2p studies, you will find dozens, literally more than 20 independent and scientific studies that show the same thing. That show that file sharing has either 
no impact or very small impact on the physical sales, that people who do the more file sharing are people who spend the more for culture. Of course, like people who borrow the more books in, in the libraries are the people who read the more, therefore the people who buy the more books. We know that, but it's being proved by real evidence, real data, scientific people. So, this is what we need to make everyone understand. Not only the policy makers, but everyone. Sharing helps culture. More than that. More than that. Not only sharing helps culture, but culture only exists if it is shared. This is how we get to know artists. This is how we get to, to, to love the works. This is how it works, and it cannot work otherwise. The same way that sharing makes us smart. The internet is born through the sharing of knowledge. Free software, Wikipedia, are born through sharing knowledge and information. Computer security, cryptography, comes from sharing knowledge. The languages we speak come from sharing knowledge. So at this stage, we have to make it very clear. This is the message we need to convey. Sharing, for Christ's sake, as a US citizen would say. Sharing, it's all about sharing. And this is what we stand for. This is what we are doing. And this is what we need to continue to do for society to no, not, not to look exactly like this, but for our society to work better. We have global issues to address right now, whether it's in the financial, the environmental, the energetic sides. How can we address those global issues if not by sharing? information, sharing knowledge, and sharing the power to decide. So this is one core thing to do at this stage, I think. We've been with a negative opposition discourses for a very long time, opposing bad legislation when they come. We can now come with a positive message. Sharing is good. All we want to do is to be able to share. And then we can address the question of how to fund creation in the digital age, the question of the business models and yada, yada, yada. But all we want to do is to share because sharing is good and we should not be ashamed of it. So we have a unique opportunity between our hands because we still have the tools to do it. And dozens of structures, I just name a few of our friends here, but dozens of structures exist already in which you can invest your time, your energy, in which you can contribute with your skills, in which you can donate money if you have no time nor skills, to, <laughs> to help promote this objective, to help promote sharing. And more importantly, if you don't recognize yourself in any of those, you can grow your own. You can create your own organization, your own structure. You can, right now, open a blog to talk about it. And this is very, very important thing to do. You have to understand that we still have, between our hands, the opportunity to do so. We still have, between our hands, the tools to do so which is basically a free, open, therefore neutral internet. And we have the knowledge on how to use it. So we have a moral imperative, because we know what is going on, because we understand what is going on. We have this responsibility to use those tools in order to defeat attacks to our fundamental freedoms and to a free internet, whatever they are, whenever they come and to promote those ideas that sharing is good and necessary. Thank you.
So I hope there are tons of questions and maybe tr um, comments or, or trolls, yeah? Uh, maybe uh, people could, could line up in front of the microphones uh, in order to make it more fair. Um, I think also that we have questions from the, the IRC people, the people from the internet. So we will ask them for, for their questions as well. So I see a question here. Yeah, this is a question oh. from uh, Twitter. Uh, the question is, uh, what is uh, the ACTA committee and can you give a brief explanation? C can you repeat that please? Uh, what is the ACTA committee and can you give a brief explanation? Okay, so the, the ACTA committee is created by uh, the, the, um, the last section of the ACTA agreement. It creates some kind of administrative body that is uh, some kind of ACTA secretariat uh, that is ruled by the member signatories of ACTA and they, they shall uh, supervise further implementation of the agreement, agreement providing guidelines so when something in the text say oh you may do this and that they could write guidelines saying oh here is how to do it and do it and also the ACTA committee will have for a mission to review amendments so each member signatory of ACTA can submit amendments, say, oh, this may here, it's too weak, let's transform it into a must. And then I think the, the members have to decide collectively, but once again, as it's not transparent, as it's not democratic, we won't know how those decisions will be taken. So maybe it's once again the US and the EU Commission that will say, okay, we agree, okay, everybody agrees, that's done. So, sir, in front of the microphone. Yep. Hi, I have a question. Um, there's a multi-billion industry working the other way. What makes you think you can win? S sorry again? There's a multi-billion industry working the other way. What makes you think you can win? Huh. <laughs> um, first of all, hope. <laughs> because if I give up hope... Uh -huh. um, Second, the fact that we already won in the past. I gave the example of the software patents, of some votes around the telecoms package that were very unlikely to, to succeed. Uh, and also there is one example in the very same field as ACTA, which was um, a trade agreement called, in French it was AMI. It was a multi-investment agreement back in the 80s that was rejected because of public outrage. And also I think we may win because if you think about it, there may be only one thing stronger than those multi-billion corporate, and that's us. That's us, properly informed and properly connected. And I do not see anything else that could be stronger. My question is, um, in how far do you think that this sharing is something like a prototype of a coming collaborative economy? Um, because economy advances from capitalism to somewhere, and uh, how far do you think that the sharing uh, the, that this community, this special community here is doing, will uh, is, is sort of just a, a prototype of a collaborative economy? Exactly. Mm. Um. If I had an answer to your question, maybe I would be a Nobel Prize at this, at this time. But now, just a few, um, a few hints, maybe. Look at free software. We demonstrate with free software that we can do things better by sharing. Look at Wikipedia. I'm not saying that Wikipedia is true. I'm just saying that Wikipedia just works. Oh, somebody called a doctor. <laughs> But it, it just works. So maybe it's by the practice. Maybe it's by talking about it, by stressing it out, like I think it is necessary, and also by practicing it and showing it to the world, showing it to the people who didn't understand it yet. And then maybe the process will adapt. I think that in the, in the battle of copyright, I think the key will be the, sh the swift of the artists. The day the authors and the artists will understand that internet works for them and not against them, then they can help switch the balance and we win, I think. 
So it's about helping the artists, like the, the humble indie bundle for the video games, like the exam examples of Nina Paley, everybody heard of Nine Inch Nails and Radiohead and so on. So first of all, helping the artists who promote sharing, and then go to all the others and explain them why they would benefit from sharing. So I think it's the practice that will little by little change the minds, and maybe in the global economic field, it will be when the investors will understand that. Thank you. Um, one difficulty I see often is with secret trade agreements is that first of all they're secret. Um, second of all, is, is there a lobby group like La Quadrature du Net who does active lobbying in Brussels and all over the world and um, to kind of uh, get to know these people and join these people? Um, the question is um, not that simple because lobbying by itself can be understood in many different ways. Um, I don't see myself as a lobbyist when I'm in the corridors of the European Parliament. First of all, because I don't wear a necktie, and also because I don't have the same methods. What we do at La Quadrature du Net is public, open, and we don't promote uh, uh, specific interest, but all vision of general interest. So let's say advocacy or just exercising. Um, Persuasion power on the decision makers. Yeah, that's a different name for lobbying. In the end, it is lobbying. Um, so the well, others do we, it. we can discuss that further, but yeah. I, okay. the, the, in, in English, you have the term advocacy that I think fits well. Well, you have lots of groups who are committed into defeating ACTA at the moment. People from access to medication, I didn't mention, but ACTA has also a deep impact on access to medication because of its role on patents and, and trademarks and border measures, and maybe we'll discuss about that later. You can find me in the lounge. Uh, so uh, people like Médecins Sans Frontières, people like Oxfam are advocating against ACTA. Um, in the US, you have organizations such as us Ours, like uh, Public Knowledge, uh, Knowledge Ecology International, the EFF, I think, works a bit uh, on that. Um, you have also, and it is very interesting, uh, and it's also part of the answer to the, to the first question. Um, telecom industries and internet service provider industries are also very much against ACTA. They put very seldom press releases, but they actively lobby against it. They cannot show it publicly, but they do lobby against it. So it's, in my definition of lobbying, something that is done under the carpet, you cannot really be aware of. But what, what I really think, and this is, what, this is why I'm here, and this is what we do at La Quadrature du Net, is the way to win is to provide the tools for everyone, for the citizens, to go and inform the elected representatives, to do the job of the lobbies, but with honesty, with their knowledge and mind and their own words, and to go in direct contact with their own elected representatives. I think this is stronger and more beneficial to the society as a whole than lobbying, and that this is what we should do. So I guess sharing this talk would already, for everyone, uh, be a step to, to uh, get everyone more aware of the problems. Yep. Thanks. Um, maybe, maybe a question from the internet? Where is the internet? Let's oh, hear a question oh. from this. A question from, from a, a, short, a short question, Jeremy. You said this year the parliament will have one vote on ECTA. Do you have an assumption when? Huh. It's a very good question. <laughs> no. Um, I think it should be somewhere in the middle of the year. Okay. It's not clear at the moment if it will be before the summer or after. And I honestly don't know what parameters will decide that. I think it should go into some kind of review in some bodies of the EU before it comes back for, um, to the Parliament. But if you follow La Quadrature du Net Twitter feed at La Quadrature or uh, RSS or whatever, you, you'll be informed of it way long enough Thanks. before, I hope. Has the internet a question? Where is the internet?
Who, who has the internet? I have an answer to the question from uh, just earlier. I got an answer from the Hungarian government about uh, how this will be ratified, and they answered that the ACTA agreement will be open for signing starting from the 31st of March, and there will be an OECD meeting, I think, uh, in Tokyo or something. I might be make, mixing up things, and it will be signed at the ministerial level there. So we need to find out when the OECD meeting is, and then we know the vote in the European Parliament must precede that. Thank you, Steph. Oh, the internet finally yeah. came with a question. Um, question from IRC. Uh, didn't the whole home music is killing uh, home music is killing music already prove that the industry is only screaming for nothing? Um, I'm sorry, my, my hearing is bad. Uh, can you re repeat that, maybe yes. closer to the mic? Didn't the whole home music is killing music already prove that the industry is only screaming for nothing? Well, um, it's proving it for people who watch it and know it and are curious about it at the moment. And this is, this is where we have some, some crucial role to play. Because they already play the battle for the minds in, in the broad field. You remember that, uh, that ad, you wouldn't steal a car. Well, it is approximately at the beginning of every DVD. So anyone who doesn't care about home music or the distribution means or what is the internet and what is peer-to-peer -peer and whatever, already has implanted in his mind that multiplying zeros and ones is like stealing. It's like subtracting. That multiplication is subtraction. So the, the evil ideas of our opponents are already planted in the minds. And this is what we have to work with at the moment. So I think it's not that easy. Okay. Oh, first, sir, who is waiting here for quite some time. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. Uh -huh. uh, because on the one hand, we have the multi-billion dollar companies. And on the other hand, uh, closer to the mic, please. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, people like us who are informed and who make an informed choice that sharing is good because they know the uh, cultural implications and the philosophical yes. and yes. things like that. But we have also many people who are just consumers who share, like they would switch on RTL uh, for some afternoon uh, pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, how do we reach those? masses, how do we reach the Moogles, so to speak, the, those who are not informed what the implications are of sharing is good, not just getting well, it for free, but uh, for our culture? Well, they, they, they have it already in some way, because basically everybody does file sharing. Ask a 15 years old kid, okay. uh, teenager, how he gets or she gets his or her music or movies from. 99% it will be, ah, the internet. So people see it is good because they benefit from it and they have access to culture. But they think it is good but wrong. So we have to make it clear that it's good but good instead of good but wrong. How much time is left? Just one, one more question. From the internet. From the internet and then mm. I really want to thank you for your talk and oh, everything. It was really nice. interesting. I think it but was interesting, guys, let's right? Say two questions. Just one more. I'm oh, really okay. sorry, but there are more people that... Okay, I tried. I, I think tried my best. everyone yeah. is very anxious to wait what's going to happen today. And mm. yeah, Okay, so one, one question from the internet. Okay, yeah, the internet, RSA. guys. So you have one more question. Uh, one question from RSA. Uh, Make how, it count. How can we develop a, a system that can create the cultural habits of free software environments for, uh, for culture? Will the real developers for CVS and Git for music please stand up? We have the li licenses, we are missing the tools. Developers, please join the dream. It's kind of a dual question. Mm -hmm. Well, not uh, a question. But. I, well, I understood neither... Uh, can, Could can you repeat you, that? You, uh, Basically, the question is, how can we develop a system that can create the cultural habits of free software environment for culture? Wow, that's a good one. I think it, I think it doesn't start with software. I think it really starts with a, with a battle for the minds, and uh, yeah, and it's it's with sharing sharing the knowledge we have with the with the, the the authors and with the artists, and helping them with understanding that the internet is good for them, 
and that sharing is good for them. Could, could you say that it starts with the offline community? It starts with people understanding instead uh, of... Uh, I, I wouldn't say it needs to be offline because we do most yeah, of what of course, we do online. But, but it doesn't start with a bit of code. I think it starts with a, with a chatter. With, with talking. Yeah, with I think a so. dialogue. I think actually. so. Well, I want to thank Jeremy so much. I want you guys to give him a big round of applause. I think. Oh, come on, people. That can go louder. Come on. It was really good, right? Woo! I think I can hear, I can get something more out of them, don't you think? <laughs> I think we should scream and stamp and clap one more time. Jeremy Zimmer. <laughs>